before your computer told you a printer to print, there's no negative charge on the service of the conductor. But now there is negative charge on the service of the conductor. So I said, where does that charge come from? And I went to the 20 top experts in the world and said, where does the charge come from? And none of them would reply. All of them have electricity going down the one wire into the lamp and coming back. They might go along the top wire, down through the lamp and back through the bottom wire. However, if you have this idea that that's the wrong way around, that it's actually negative electrons, then you have the battery and negative electrons going along the bottom wire, going fighting the way through the lamp and coming back along the top wire. All they have to do is go into the next office and discuss their contradictory comments on the very simple question, where does that charge come from on the bottom conductor? science, where we explore the limit of what is known by taking very smart people and asking them lots of questions. Today with us on the show, we have again Mr. Ivor Katt, and we have a conversation lined up about some inconsistencies in conventional electromagnetic theory. This is actually our second conversation with Mr. Cat. We had him on the show previously to talk about something that he calls the glitch, which is a potentially disastrous design flaw in conventional computer systems. If you want to check that out, that's in the archives. But today is all about the magical fluid that is electric current. So welcome, Mr. Cat. Thank you. So you first came across these issues in electromagnetic theory and posed your concerns to the academics through what is now known as the famed cat question. Could you orient us towards the cat question and how you came across these inconsistencies in electromagnetic theory in the first place? Now, I am 85, and in what you just said, there are events that took place um, and other events that took place 30 years later, and you, you've joined them all together. We're dealing with an enormous amount of time, and um, so... That's the, us, that's, yes. the, that's the benefit of storytelling, which is that when you tell stories, you're able to take vast amounts of time and compress them into a, into a short little Hour piece. Hour-long podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So bring us up to speed. Yes, but, but, but my education was uh, dislocated. Mm. Um, lots of different schools. The tutor who was supposed to teach me electricity died which was very fortunate because then I wasn't taught <laughs> electricity. And, um, but I had the Cambridge qualification so I could get a job anywhere because if you employ a Cambridge engineer and he's no good, it's not your fault. It's Cambridge's fault. <laughs> so I was in, um, well, I, I was in Francie, Manchester, first of all, but the key thing is when I was in Motorola, um, in Phoenix, Arizona, and, um, Integrated circuits were, were there, they were very recent, um, and they'd become very fast, and computers were big. And so a signal would go uh, a yard or two yards between one logic gate and the next. And um, the signal goes at the speed of light, but... Um, it was important because the logic, our logic was faster than anybody else's. Our logic was ECL. The other people's was TTL. And it was important to understand how and whether the signals interfered with each other in a distance of one yard. And uh, so I was let loose on this with plenty of money. And uh, not for me, but equipment. Uh, this is in Motorola Phoenix. And um, I said, what happens if you send a signal down one wire parallel with another wire, how much of it cross-talks onto the other wire? 
Now, I, and I developed all the theory and made the discoveries, major discoveries. But unfortunately, the speed of the logic stayed the same, but the size of the computer diminished. So as now it's in your pocket, you see. So now you don't have to understand the signals. So there was a window of opportunity when uh, everybody would have been under compulsion to understand the process. Now, this um, had happened in the past. Um, uh, Heaviside went up to um, Newcastle to help his brother look at the way telephone signals, this is in 1880, the way telephone signals went down wires and whether they interfered with each other and so on. And um, there was distortion, so you could not uh, talk on a telephone um, a more than quite a short distance, you know. But you could send pulses, uh, so you sent pulses, but that still there was distortion. And he did, did the theory in 1880 and decided that he had made breakthroughs, which was true. Um, but, um, and he decided he'd devote his life to science. So he went home and never again earned salary from the age of 20. And he thought that because what he was doing was so important, uh, salary should be delivered to him. And it wasn't. So um, I know the feeling. Anyway, I said, I know the feeling. Now, this is Heaviside 1880, um, trying to send more signals, pulses, between Newcastle and Denmark, because he went across to Denmark and so on. But after two or three, a couple of years, and he was still only 20, he, he went down back to his parents' home in London and said, I'm not going to earn any money. Uh, ever again um i'll obviously because what's i'm i'm doing is so important that the money will come which it didn't anyway um that now that exactly maps on to either cat in um uh 100 years later um finding that it's very important that that if you make big computers you should understand how the signals go between one end and the other end of a uh, six foot wide computer. Um, and, and nobody was uh, willing to understand. And they could, uh, a, few, a few decades later, the computer uh, became very small, but the speed of the logic did not become faster, you see. If the logic had been come even faster, but the speed of the logic is the same as it was um, 30, 40 years ago. And so, so the distortion I, I, just isn't as much of a problem because there aren't... Because of length, the distance. Right. So I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I'm expert. Ivor, let me ask you, to, could you mind moving your glasses so that uh, the viewers can see your Perfect. beautiful face? All right. Thank uh, you, sir. So I'm an expert on a dead subject, which nobody need, needs to understand. Um, the survivor is the way your computer talks to your printer, telling it to print. Now, um, when your computer sends a signal to your printer, in, in your bedroom, you know, it it's, changes a wire from 0 volts to 3 volts, one single step, you see, okay? And that step goes at the speed of light from your computer to your printer. Now, um, we're 50 years into the digital age, but that particular signal is not in any textbook or in any university course. Uh, the only thing you learn is what happens if you send a sine wave down a transmission line from one place to another, because the people who control education and all the journals and so on still control education and journals and they are um radio men um a radar radar is not a pulse i've been employed on radar and various other things where the only things you send from one place to another are sine waves 
And so what what is the difference in learning about the transmission of a sine wave versus a step wave? Why is this so instrumental? Once you have a sine wave, uh, you can load loads of ma complex mathematics on it, but you can't actually see what is happening. And what is happening is the, the, the two wires, one was at naught volts and the other was at, at naught volts. Then one is at naught volts and the other is at three volts. But in the new condition, there is negative charge on the bottom conductor, you see. Now, half of academics don't know that or don't want to know that or don't care. But the point is, on the bottom conductor, whereas before your computer, computer told you a printer to print, there's no ch negative charge on the surface of the conductor. But now there is negative charge on the surface of the conductor. So um, I knew that um, you couldn't uh, advance um, science. You could not advance uh, theory because, because the old theory was what was the basis for the reputations and the careers and the textbooks of the academics and the school teachers. So what I did was I did what my Lieber said she told me um, a decade ago was um, the Socratic method. I thought I'd stumbled on it a few days ago, <laughs> but now I find I already knew it. So I, so I said, where does that charge come from? And, and, no, and, and I went to the 20 top experts in the world you know, you could find them by going on Google and find they were into electromagnetism and said, where's the charge come from? And none of them would reply. See? So, um... They were very busy, obviously. Oh, and important. Very busy and very important. <laughs> but eventually people started to reply to you, right? It seems like uh, you were getting contradicting answers at some points. Yeah, no. Prior to that, my college, which was Newton's College, Trinity Cambridge sent to me and said, we're the leading college in the leading university. Uh, we need money to stay there. So I wrote to the master um, saying, look, you, you've refused to discuss electromagnetic theory or the cat question or anything with me for 20 years. Um, please get your top expert to comment on the cat question, see? Where does that charge come from? So, um, uh, <laughs> what's his name? Um, Pepper, uh, Michael Pepper was chosen by the master of, Trinity, of Newton's college to write to me. And he wrote rubbish to me, you know, talking about all sorts of strange things like plasma and, um, but independently of that, uh, because I, I'd realized there were fatal flaws in classical theory, I went to the head of the Cavendish, which is the Cambridge Physics Lab, who happened to have personal connections with me. So being too important or too busy wasn't strong enough for him to refuse to communicate, which is what he should have done, because I was asking a question which led to fatal flaws in classical theory, which you're not allowed to be involved with that, um, as the Italians said and everybody says. Um, so anyway, he, he wrote a long letter um, in 1983, um, which, was, um, which was nonsense, see? Then Pepper wrote nonsense 10 years later. But Pepper was employed by Howie, you see, in, in the Cavendish, the top physics lab. So they're, they're giving me contradictory answers mm. to my question, my, my humble request for clarification of classical theory, not saying there's anything wrong with classical theory. So uh, one of them answered that the charge comes from the bottom. One of them answers it comes from the top. Is it something like that? No, no. One of them said it comes from what I call the south, which you're calling the bottom. And the other said it comes from the west. Now, in one case, you have a battery on the left or in the west and a lamp on the right and two wires, you see. 
Now, in that case, um, the the um, the idea is that the battery is connected down the two wires to the lamp, and this electricity goes round. You see, but also negative charge appears on the bottom conductor. Where does it come from? You see. Now, now here you have two people, the top man in the Cavendish um, and the man immediately below him in the Cavendish, who was net later uh, um, uh, knighted for services to physics and received the Faraday Medal. And he had written rubbish to me about the cat question, you see. And his boss, the head of the Cavendish, had written rubbish to me about the cat question. Now, the third man in the Cavendish was um, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Brian Josephson, you see, who had also said silly things about the cat question. And it's very unfortunate that, um, that I pick on individuals. But what are you supposed to do? You know, if you find, if you select five people who, who are all talking nonsense, you, you know, oh, that's not good enough. Maybe they're all nonsense but somewhere else there are professors and 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 it seems like they the all these people were were still at this point treating the electrons like these little bowling balls that were supposed to come out of one side of the dispenser and come into the other or something like this did you ever hear about the pointing vectors or the heavy sides energy or anything like this at this time or when did you first sort of think that there might be some other solution besides the little electrons flowing through the wire. Yeah, now I, I can go two ways, um, <coughs> or, or or three ways. But one thing that um, that I ought to raise is my article called "The Death of Electric Current," mm. which was published in Wireless World. Which, by the way, the Cavendish subscribed to Wireless World. So although it was low level, the Cavendish had. And this is in Howie's letter. You know, he says, the cat, I know about your stuff because the Cavendish subscribes to Wireless World. So they'd read about this problem, but not one man in the Cavendish approached me during the next 50 years. Okay, because they knew, knew they mustn't. Because you mustn't get involved with something possibly leading to a fatal flaw in classical theory. Because if you go that way, your funding stops, you know, because funding agencies don't, don't want to pump money into a field wh where there's disagreement. Of course, science, true science, is a uh, disagreement. And, you, and like Kuhn says, in the structure of scientific revolutions, advance is by revolution. Advance is by destroying careers and reputations. And were all these gentlemen answering you in terms of the flow of electric charge? Were they, you know, I've heard you use this term magical fluid for electricity before, which I think is, is really brilliant. Do you... No, I, don't, I don't think that's me. Oh, okay. I Forrest, thought... Forrest, Forrest Bishop. Oh, Forrest Bishop, your, your friend. Oh. I see. Okay. But were all of these answers coming to you in the form of the flow of charge? All of them have electricity going down the one wire into the lamp and coming back. They might go along the top wire, down through the lamp and back through the bottom wire. However, if you have this idea that that's the wrong way around, that it's actually negative electrons, then you have the battery and negative electrons going along the bottom wire, going fighting the way through the lamp and coming back along the top wire, you see. And um, the electricity is, is somehow, it gets, it delivers energy to, um, to the lamp. Now, um, Heaviside. And so fundamentally, the question here is what is delivering the motive force and how does it get there? No, no. The, the question, the ca if you... Now, what question? You're talking about the cat question. Well, well, I th well, the cat question is seeking to to answer, I think. Th so the cat question is, where does the negative charge on the bottom conductor come from? It, it, it's a very narrow, narrow question. But, but there's the another wider question. question and the one that's still at play in modern physics, as far as I can tell. Is where is the motive force coming from? How does the motive... Because 
people have known since 1900 that the drift speed of electrons does not match with the speed of current propagation. And there have been many attempts at answering that question. We're, we're making an episode about this right now. And so you have the Drude model of electron propagation, where it's the front of movement that moves. Then you have the Summerfield Drude model, where it's this Fermi gas that's moving through the circuit. But at the end of the day, these things, these models are incompatible with all observations. And so there is this gap in our understanding of where the motive force between the battery and the light is coming from. And or this, how it arrives. Or how it arrives. And this is sort propagates. of, and this is what links you to Heaviside because Heaviside had an answer to this and you seem to have an answer to this. Um. Oh, I, I think the word is conflating, conflate. Uh, you're conflating one thing with another thing. I, I haven't used the word conflate, conflate ever before. I would say we're inflating it because <laughs> we're actually taking the, the very narrow cat question and we're blowing it up into a bigger question, which uh, yeah, is. Yeah, but, yeah, but yes, but in the process, you're look. You're letting off all those guys off the hook. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> because these guys... We should round them up. <laughs> these guys don't have to come up with a long story about how the battery lights and all that stuff. All they have to do is go into the next office and discuss their contradictory comments on the very um, simple question... Where does that charge come from on the bottom conductor? Now, if, if they refuse to answer that, they have to be um, ridiculed. They have to lose their jobs. <laughs> and that's nothing to do with Summerfield or all these people you're bringing in. Well, except they, for the... the they, yeah. Excuse me. They are talking nonsense and they are not willing to walk into the next office and discuss the contradictory nonsense. that Now, this... This must not be linked up with theories of how electricity works and stuff like that. These are separate. I insist on that. Now, uh, Heaviside, Heaviside in 1980 was part way through to, to getting to the fundamentals, but he didn't get the whole way. That, that, that took another 80 years. You know, Cat made the final step. Um, and now, Heaviside, 1980, and I published an article, The Death of Electric Current, and it's in front of me. And um, if your, your listeners do, do a, a search for The Death of Electric Current plus CAT, they'll find it. Unfortunately, the, the, the best version is a PDF, you know, so they'll have to know, have to know the... the the address it's it's on the web this is all on the web and has been ignored for 40 years and no professor or academic who's teaching or studying electromagnetic theory will make any comment on any of what we're talking about because it damages his career and his reputation if he does this is very important that that you're you're you're, you're uh, as as um the, the professor in the international conference said to the other professor, you must not get involved with cat or the cat question or it'll damage your career and reputation. This is in black and white. This is a book called Lanimalia, published, unfortunately, only in Italian uh, and in Polish, not, not, in British, not in English. Well, I'm really surp I'm quite surprised that these academics uh, didn't point you to heavy sides. And, and for this very simple reason that it seems like the most favored solution is based on heavy sides at the moment. There was a video that came out on the world's most popular science channel today Veritasium. about the pointing vector solution to the propagation of electric currents, which is, for, for, you know, to simplify things, heavy sides independently arrived at the pointing vector solution, which is the idea of field transmission of electric current rather than through the wires themselves. So I'm really surprised that these academics didn't at least bring pointing vectors and heavy sides into the fold. When did you become fascinated with heavy sides? How did you find his work? When I was in Motorola, heavy side, and I, I and I was and I was helping 
the Americans to make better integrated circuits to get to the moon um, for some reason. Um, I had never heard of Heaviside. I did not know about Heaviside um, because he was silenced. Mm. He did not appear in any textbook for more than half a century. He had disappeared. It's not my incompetence that I didn't come upon him. You'll find no mention of Heaviside in any textbook on electromagnetic theory from, let's say, 1910 until 1960. But, but textbooks are notoriously filled with white lies. Like this is, this is, you know, you see this in biology. I think they biology. still got the Bohr model of the atom in the yeah, chemistry textbook. Yeah, I mean, textbooks. if you go to a chemistry textbook, it's still these little like blips of, of proton, neutron and orbiting electron because it's simpler. You know, it, it, we give white lies to children on the basis that this is the simplest way to not confuse their sad little brains. And hopefully if they continue to learn, they'll get to heavy side eventually. But, but I think that you are onto something when you say that there is a reluctance to reimagine very, very fundamental assumptions about what is electric current. Because electric current has proven to be very, very useful in its current formulations. It is hard to argue with the fact that technology has exploded. Our ability to accomplish things with electrical engineering and hardware engineering and software engineering is just fine. It doesn't seem like there's this big gap in technological understanding on that level. And so it's very, very easy to just continue to move forward piece by piece, technology by technology, without going back and asking if we have the right answer. Things look similar to each other from sufficiently high up. If it ain't broken, don't fix it. Right? And it's the idea that something's coming from the battery and going to the light bulb works. Right? If there's a negative charge that appears in the bottom conductor, that's a loose thread that you've pulled on, and it has created a situation where you can, you can point to the fact that something isn't right. But that being not right doesn't affect technology, and that's why people are reluctant to reimagine it, because it's like, well, why bother? And that's a problem with all of science. I mean, that's just, that's fundamentally a problem with all of science because you have reputations, careers, institutions, everything that is built on the foundation of a functional theory. And so the question is, whose job is it to reimagine this? I think that the position that you're in, which is that you're someone outside of the academy, attempting to reimagine this, this is exactly... As the, was Heaviside. As was Heaviside. The, you cannot have someone who is vested in an institution reimagine the institution. That is not how institutions work. You cannot rise to the top of an institution and then turn around and destroy it. At every single stage, you have been vetted to ensure that you will support the institution. But it didn't stop them from adopting Heaviside's ideas, Heaviside. right? Heavyside's, uh, his, oh, they're yeah, his ideas, right? No, no, right? No, 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 I mean, no, no. who adopted Heavyside? Well, the words, like, he coined the words impedance and conductance. Right. Like, they when, still use these concepts. And when, as far as I understand it. When did it, he coin them? He coined, I mean, during his lifetime. Yeah, I during think. his lifetime. No, no, he, no. he also, he, <laughs> co he coined the term permeability, permittance, reluctance. Uh, he also patented the first coaxial cable. Like, he's done a lot that's still in the world today. And honestly, the pointing vector, like I said, is the contemporary solution to the transmission of electric current. Energy. It, but it's weird energy. because it's not yes. current, it's yes. energy. Sorry, it's sorry. electric energy, which it, is... There's problems with that. We can talk about that in a minute. But he's, his, his spirit still remains, despite the fact that he was pushed out of the cloistered discussions. On some things. Right? Because these ideas do belong to him and they are present. So what is, what is the fracture here? Where does it live? You have to distinguish between Heaviside's ideas and the man Heaviside. Heaviside disappeared. He disappeared from the record for, for more than half a century. Cat disappeared in 1970, 67. In 1967, Cat disappeared, and he was off the record for 50 years. This is, this is nothing to do with Cat's ideas or Heaviside's ideas. 
the individual disappeared. Well, Heaviside was 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 a strange man. Yeah, cats are strange man. And that got to do with it. Well, because got to do with it. it. It has to do. So, from where I'm sitting, it seems that the presence of men, women, whatever in this field has to do with politics. And the reason that Heaviside disappears is because well, he won't play the... it's a team project. It's a team project. Right? And so you have, to, you have to accumulate the love and the appreciation and the, the respect of the people in the field for them to follow you somewhere. Like, I think by the end of Heaviside's career, he was dropping his, his publications off semi-anonymously inside of a grocery store because he didn't want to make contact with his publishers. Like he was that isolated that he was, he was somehow averse to meeting with the public and with people related to this. Didn't you say that he filled his house with granite furniture that he had brought somewhere? And he painted his nails pink quite, quite ahead of his time. I quite think that's, that's quite popular with the kids today. But At any rate, he made it very difficult to, for him to be interacting with that society at the time. And you can make the argument that the people that have the most astonishing ideas are often the most difficult to get along with and the most difficult to integrate into a community. And so what happens is that you have an idea that continuously appears, you know, it, it appeared with heavy side, it appeared with you, it seems to be surfacing again, because like, like Michael said, there's, there's this huge science channel, Veritasium, that just did a video about this. People are talking about it. It requires finding someone who is able to charm the establishment enough for them to be able to say that they are wrong in public. And that is a very special kind of person who has both this sort of quasi-savant understanding and also has an understanding of people and is able to join those. And often scientists are not that. Scientists are ideas people. They're not people people. And so you can be brilliant, but if you don't have a support network that distributes your ideas, your ideas flounder because you cannot be an island in the sea of science. You have to have a community that supports you. And that community has to be well respected. Now that breaks down in the case of Kat, because Kat had ideas on how computers should progress. And, and so, because the computer industry was very conservative, you, couldn't, you could, could not develop computers the way Kat wanted it. And, um, and, uh, but later, um, Cat pursued the matter with the British government, and the British government funded Cat's ideas. And um, then there was research money into three universities um, on what's called Cat Spiral, and it came to market with a claim. This is the period during which Cat disappeared, disappeared from the record for fifty years on electromagnetic theory. So you have this problem that Kat's involved in two things. One is innovation in computer architecture, where he made a lot of money and had a lot of fame and was in the Sunday Times. But the same Kat had disappeared for 50 years. All right. Now, now what you've got to propose is that in, in the case of Kat, he was very good and very sociable when it came to computer architecture and knew how to do what you just said, be sociable. But it, when he went over to electromagnetic theory, he, he was obnoxious, and that's why uh, he, he was silenced. It doesn't work, because you're seeing the, t the two sides of the same coin in the same person, you see? And, and you, can, you, can look at, you can look at that on my website. It's called The Two Cats, you mm. know, the, the famous cat who did all this thing, a guest lecturer at 14 universities in four countries. Kat was right at the center of the establishment, academic establishment, whatever. And yet you can read that Kat uh, was out, an amateur outside of academia and structured research. Now, now the, the final example of this is the greatest scientist today. it seems i just want to summarize what you just said it seems like there's like uh there's a you're saying there's a interdepartmental 
lack of crosstalk, like getting recognized in one field, let's say engineering, is not sufficient to allow you into the discussion in the theoretical side. Is that correct? It's the message of silence, not the messenger. Very, very important. Check. Cat was a messenger in computer architecture and got the fame, got the money, got big money, you, you know, got the fame, got in the newspapers, got it. But during that period, none of the learned journals would publish anything on cats innovation in computers because learned journals are conservative now who who funds a learned journal who, who funds a university department you know um they are conservative they don't that they, they, if you bring in innovation you you destroy these people you destroy their careers you destroy their reputations to be a to be an academic in science and even in technology is an untenable position because you can't have job security reputation security in science or in technology science and technology could not be articulated onto the educational process and nobody realized that the educational process was first of all um, parents teaching latin and greek to, to their children and then it was teaching reading writing and arithmetic for the pe people who had come now into the factories from the country where they could successfully be illiterate so education was teaching greek latin english uh sorry um the three r's reading writing arithmetic and and without noticing you bring in you bring in science and technology. Now, the, the lecturers and the teachers didn't realize that they had to defend themselves against scientific advance and even technological advance by blocking it. And, and so they blocked it. So Heaviside was making an advance. So his message was, was silenced. And in the process, Heaviside was silenced. Now, now the much more interesting case is Cat. When when he he was doing what you're supposed to do, you, you know, which is make loads of money and, and and get research into universities and and be guest lecturer at universities and all that, all that. But at the same time, he was totally silenced on electromagnetic theory. You know, so so this this knocks out the conventional view. Once you say it's the message that silence not the messenger now and of course you you know nobel prize winners lots of them could not be published but later on when he published on one thing he can't cannot publish on anything else and an example is josephson you know josephson got entangled in the cat question and he's part of the establishment suppressing the cat question and yet he himself is suppressed because he tried to bring in the paranormal into science. His boss, Howie, took all his students from him because you can't bring the paranormal into science. Now, Katz, Katz's work is more threatening to science than the paranormal, you know, because... because uh, but to be clear, establishment science, uh, right? Really because it is very science. I mean, this is, the, this is the function of science fundamentally is to move forward these explanations and to point out when something hasn't been properly explained. So if it's a threat to science, it's only a threat to the construction of reputation at these massive institutions. The to be clear, the discipline of science is exactly what asks and answers these questions. Absolutely. The fact that there is a corruption does not mean that all of science and the foundation of science should be thrown away. Now, now, you've got to decide which science you're talking about. Ah. The, the transition was 1965. Now, before 1965, there was so much success from science and technology, because when I started work, I went on the half pay being an engineer, not, not a doctor or a lawyer or accountant. You know, I accepted that I was doing something 
not for, in order to earn money and get into the higher elite of society. It was, I wanted to do, well, that, that's a different subject, but I knew I was on half pay because that was 19, 1959, 1956. But by 1965, the money had flown in, such big money, that it sucked in people who didn't choose accountancy or law or medicine. They chose science and engineering in order to get prestige and money and, and secure career. They shouldn't have chosen that, you see. And, and after 1965, they became the majority and they captured all the universities, all the schools, all the textbooks and all the scientific institutions because anyone who goes to college and learns, let's call it computer, no, electri electricity, electrical engineering, he qualifies in, in obsolete electrical engineering, which predates um, the digital age. So now he pays his money to institutions which will protect his qualification. His qualification is pre-digital uh, age. So it's not academia that's blocking scientific advance. It's academia and the qualified people in that field so everybody blocks it well it's interesting that's post 1965 now you what you would i think this started because science was originally performed by folks who essentially had all the money that they needed and I believe so those folks were called barons barons yeah <laughs> the lords so there was very wealthy people who were doing science originally who were freed by virtue of the lack of financial restraints and or the, people the that devoted themselves to, to poverty. Yeah, right. I, I, heavy, sure I mean, heavy side. I'm who talking decides about to like never... in the 1600s, right? Sure, the, but even heavy side, right? He decides at 20 that he's not going to work anymore, and that's the historical arc of science. You don't get paid. You don't get anything for it. You're just sitting there and you're bobbling around trying to figure out how color works. My point is that it seems like this comes down to an infiltration of science by technologists, where there's an instrumentalization of the ideas which is brought to the foremost priority and at that point all you care about is whether it works or not and you're no longer interested in the finer details of nature's ongoings now i will i will distinguish between that and what i was talking about because because over here on the left you have science tech you have science technology science and technology and there's a division there which, which i'm not, not going to talk which i i don't want to bring in at this moment but there are people in that field now they are not there pre-1965 they were not there in order to get knighted for services to physics or get the faraday medal or, or all these things uh, or to, to make money they were there to pursue pursue the truth. When did they start giving a Nobel Prize in physics? Do we know? Sorry? I said, what year did they start giving a Nobel Prize in it physics? It started off in physics. It I started think. off in physics? Yeah. Now, now, you have to distinguish between... Um, you, I mean, basically what you're saying is that there's, there's prizes at stake that people are after. And you're saying that that's distinct from the relationship between science and technology that has become conflated. It seems like what you're suggesting is that in 1965, which is 1965 the year of the formulation of the cat question? What happened in 1965? No, about 1980. Well, so what's 1965? Um, there was a date when the percentage of people who call themselves engineers or scientists who were there for the money and the reputation, not there to pursue the truth. Now, once you, and, and they actually say, or they will refuse to say, they will not comment on the statement, science is a search for truth, which is 300,000 hits on Google. Now, these people, these parasites, I call them parasites, um, can, a cancer in science, and also chances, who came into 
my subject, which is the pursuit of truth, finding out how things really are, um, in order to find out how to get prizes and Faraday medals and all the rest of it. So you're saying that in 1965 was the tipping point. Pardon? So you're saying they control they control all of education, all the textbooks, all all the schools, and they cannot allow uh, changes in, in the dogma. I guess one what we're really interested in here at Demystifying Science is always mechanism. Like, how did this happen? Why does it happen? Yeah, so you're pinning this to 1965. The fact that this is the case, I don't think is up for debate. Right. I, it's, it's, I, I have no argument with you on the point that something happened in science that made it be much more about prizes and reputation and acknowledgements and institutional whatever. Careerism. Career, absolutely. I agree with you. You're pinning it to 1965. I've never heard someone pin it to a specific date. Why that date? There are three or four sources for that date. One is Bruce Charlton, um, not even trying. His book is not even trying. Not even trying to find out the truth. Hmm. Now, now these people who invaded my my subject say we are not searching for the truth. We're searching for ways to make better computers or better airplanes. And that's the conflation of science and technology exactly. and engineering. And the cat question is not important for that because it just works already, there's right? More than, there's more than one thing happening. Okay. Now. The, 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 the attack on science is by what I used to call mice, mm -hmm. M-I-C-E, but it's now also pop scientists. Now, mice, M-I-C-E, mathematicians, instrumentalists, um, careerists, E-M-C, but the new one is pop scientists. You see, pop scientists, you see them. I'll give you the names if you like. Do you want the names of the pop scientists? I'm I mean, sure everybody knows them yeah, already. It's ever, when you say, it's best to leave it vague because when you say pop scientist, everyone has a different picture in their mind of who they think. But the, everyone knows college, a pop scientist. My, poly, my college is now controlled by a pop scientist. And when I write to him, he doesn't reply. He can't afford to reply. He controls my college. Well, he probably cannot, also gets I like 600 get emails a day. My college. I cannot get inside my college or my... 200 university. of which are from Ivory. Sorry? I'm saying he probably gets about 600 emails a day, at least at least 100 of which are from you. It's a joke. Right? <laughs> Don't worry, Ivory. It's okay. I cannot get inside my faculty, inside my university, inside my college, inside the engineering uh, association of my college, Trinity College, Cambridge. I cannot... There was an accident that happened 40 years ago where um, <coughs> my faculty put the lecturing in the charge of a student who didn't understand, and he invited me to lecture. <laughs> so, so I came to lecture, and I was not only boycotted by all the staff, I was boycotted by the students as well. Wow. What? Because if you listen to Cat, you will score worse in your exams. That's probably that true. That might be true. Students, <laughs> students are interested in getting their exam now. Now, and, and so they, you know, you, they got to you, eat. You, you're a parrot. You're a parrot. And along comes a contrary voice. Well, you're not going to get get through your exams with the contrary voice. You see, so the students already knew that they must not attend the cat lecture. But that's the one time. Now, remember, it's before that that I was a guest lecturer at 14 universities in four countries. You know, that, that was when I was, I, I was less of a threat, see. But now I became a threat to the whole system mm. because I, I'd, I'd advanced too far. And by the way, we must mention Heaviside said, by the way, is there such a thing as electric current? This was 1980, 1880, 1880. We, we, so um, you, you have to say how much of this is Heaviside and how much is, it, is CAT. Heaviside made major advances, but he didn't get the whole way, you know, which, which happened 100 years later. 
but the, the, the final advance now has been silenced for 40 years. You, you know, that, that's now called Theory B, because unfortunately I call it Theory C. Why do you think it's the final, uh, the final step? I mean, science as we understand it is something that's ever-evolving. I don't think that either one of us believe that science has an end point. Seems like we can always understand something better than before, right? No, no. You see, you said it's always evolving. It's always self-destroying. It's t that's totally different from evolving. The concept of evolving is that, as Newton said, for political reasons, I stood on the shoulders of giants. He did not stand on the shoulders of giants, but it was best for him to say that. Well, that meant pun. I, I think that he did. I mean, he had friends who gave him ideas, like Robert Hooke came up with the inverse square law and gave it to him in a letter. <clears throat> I think that he was sort of referring to the fact that science is, is a group sport. And as far as it being an evolution, we have extinctions in evolution. Like, the history of the world is littered with bodies of idea of experiments that didn't work out. And science is no different. Sometimes we have to throw away entire species of science to be metaphorical here but you see in nine in may 26 1976 i know where i was standing i was looking north malcolm davidson my co-author co was on my right and i said there's no electric current that doesn't m map onto what you're saying you know the eureka i have found it the sudden light like you know was was the crown pure gold or was it polluted with other metals and he ran out of the bar saying i found it how, how to find out with its eureka now 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 that is very destructive um the it, so maybe we should talk about you see you you talked about science evolving evolving no Evolution involves a lot of chaos and death sometimes. Occasionally there's an enormous asteroid Mass that comes, extinct. a volcanic <laughs> eruption. There are definitely terribly, terribly destructive things that happen in the history of evolution, which then allow for the radiation of new forms. And you have to have a moment where there's something terrible that happens that cuts the old forms off at the knees. And this is kind of what you're talking about, which is that you have an idea that would cut the old forms off at their knees, which is that there's no such thing as electric current. And, and I, to most people, that probably sounds wild. Yeah, I want to know, what, you, what do you mean by there's no such thing as electric current? Because certainly there is current by definition. But what do you mean that there is no current? Um, Heaviside said, the conductor is the obstructor, and the dielectric is the something else. The energy does not travel in the conductor. It travels in the space around the conductor. This is the pointing vectors as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, these are the pointing vectors as well. Now in Maxwell's, here, heavy side, announce theory H, theory H. Now, in Maxwell's theory, there is a potential energy of displacement produced in the dielectric parts by the electric force, and there is the kinetic or magnetic energy of the magnetic induction due to the magnetic force in all parts of the field, including the conducting parts. They are supposed to be set up by the current in the wire. They, that is, the, the field is supposed to be set up by the current in the wire. We reverse this. The current in the wire is set up by the energy transmitted through the medium around it. This is, this is um, what is it? What book are you reading out of? Well, this is my article, The Death of Electric Current, mm. I quote Heaviside. But what is this medium around it? In this case, it would be the air, right? Is, is it the air? Is it the insulator? It's the insulator, yeah. Now, by the way, is there such a thing as electric current? Okay. Now, um, oh, uh, Fleming. Fleming. It is important. But let's look at the date. We've no made no progress since these people. 1898. Fleming. It is important that the student should bear in mind that, although we are accustomed to 
speak of the current as flowing in the wire in one direction or the other. This is a mere form of words. What we call the current in the wire is, to a very large extent, a process going on in the space or material outside the wire. Just as we familiarly speak of the sun rising and setting when the effect is really due to the rotation of the earth, so the ordinary language we use in speaking about electric currents flowing in conductors retains the form impressed upon it by older and erroneous assumptions as to their nature. Now, when you ask any professor, uh, a relevant professor, should we, you knowingly lie to a student in order to help an electrician to wire up a house? They'll say yes. He will, he will refuse, no, he won't say it. He will refuse to answer. Interesting, because most people that I've posed that question to have acknowledged that lying to students is necessary to simplify things. I've never encountered, this is, this is what I was saying at the beginning. We lie to students, and I say this as someone who teaches at a university, because opening up the yawning chasm of uncertainty of electric current isn't there, and it's really a field that moves outside the current. This isn't well studied. This isn't well understood. This doesn't have a finality and a, a tangible quality to it. And so what you say is you basic, I, honestly, I think that the way that it should be presented is, look, this isn't what's actually happening, but it is a good enough model for you to be able to wire a house. If you want to know more, follow up with these people. But that's not what's said, and I think that that's the problem. Because telling white lies to people in order to be able to say, hey, the Bohr model of the atom is good enough for you to understand how how light works in terms of, you know, uh, atomic orbital changes, fine. It works. It gets you down the road long enough to be able to ask a different question. There's a small subset of people that will find themselves... It gets you long enough down the road to be, be, be enable you to what? To either ask a different well, question... To get a job to and get to a, build it stuff. It also gets you further that, enough down the road in order to block scientific advice. That's hard that's to a, argue That's with. an unfortunate side effect that is an unfortunate of training side people. Effect. No, that's the primary effect. There is no scientific advance now. Well, that's a side effect. No one was, no one was interested in science in the first place. Yeah. You don't understand. Like, the, the kids in, in their colleges aren't being trained in science. They're being trained to be technologists, to be builders of machinery and technology. This and the is the value of, of in a capital-centric society. We're interested in building things that will make for product they will make for commerce These science people, is not science, a commercial science is about curiosity and how things work and honestly it's not clear that the heavy side solution makes the technology any easier except for tesla isn't tesla in here somewhere now because 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 my primary subject is mathematics but i've seen through it you, you know mm. it's not not going anywhere um, I, um, I did engineering, but I chose the most, let's call it scientific branch or mathematical branch of engineering, which was computers. Now, um, computers, hardware, not programming, were heading more and more into what's called science, right? Were they? You had to, you had to know better what was really happening mm. uh, between those wires, down those long cables. Which is why they hired you and to characterize that it. that information was being blocked because I was in the most scientific aspect of good practical men making good working things. And also, um, at that time, multi-million pound projects developing digital systems were being abandoned because they would not work. And that's in my first book, my second book, Computer Worship. The enormous lawsuits against computer companies are demanding millions of pounds in damages because customers had bought computers because that, that's what you had to do to, to look as though you were a fashionable company. And they bought these computers, they didn't work. Now, all this is forgotten now, but, but, but computer systems 
were developed with enormous investment and then abandoned because the noise problems meant they wouldn't work. And you're suggesting that the noise problems come from a fundamental misunderstanding of what is actually propagating. Correct, yeah. And where it's propagating. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, my book, Computer Worship's not on the web, but... Does the heavy side solution, does the heavy side's cat solution to the problem improve the technological abilities, potentially? Now, heavy side still had electric current in, in the wire. He didn't go the whole way, but cat realized that the wires only guide the energy. Like, like as I've said, um, the rails guide a train going from London to Edinburgh. Nothing travels inside the rails. It's quite difficult conceptually to see that. But the rails, and I, I say in a humorous article I've sent you, that within the rails are railons, you know, mm -hmm. which travel inside the rail <laughs> in order to guide the train. That's what the electricity is, you see. It's, it's traveling inside the rails. The, the wires are the rail. The wires, in the case of the battery lighting the lamp, are the rails. In the case of the the train going from London to Edinburgh. Okay. But now the, the, this this is, is a conceptual uh, change which is too hard to take. It's been stated, um, fully stated by me, half a century ago. It's totally ignored. Now, what was it that you said you, you'd ask people about? Should you knowingly lie? Mm. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Now, the point is, if, um, you, you see, you have to say, you see, should you knowingly lie to students in order to help an electrician to wire up a house? Or should you knowingly lie to electricians in order to help an electrician? Now, the lying has progressed back through to protecting false theories, okay? Which are, uh, the lying is excused on the basis that there is no truth anyway. Now, this is in, in Popper. Now, bear in mind that none of these professors or academics or textbook writers have studied sociology of science, philosophy of science, or um, history of science. They don't know the background to their, their own subject. Now, I used to think that it was very wrong that, that scientists should be debarred from any high position in politics. But I now realize that scientists are, um, that they're, they're loads of um, apprentices with no, no sorcerer. You know, they're extremely dangerous because they don't know what they're doing. And, and and this reached the ultimate in the glitch, you, you know, where you say to to John Dory, you know, okay, it's it's only statistical. We'll only if we do it right, we'll only have a third world war. The risk is only one in a million that we'll have a third world war. You know, ooh, don't worry about that because because that was in the glitch. You know, we we proved that the Stoll aircraft worked. You know, because they didn't crash. Statistically, they would crash, but not enough planes flew. So you put it in the passenger aircraft. Statistically, not enough crashed. None of them crashed. So you put it in the Polaris missile ship, you see. These people are dangerous. That, that, that They must not be allowed into positions of political power. Of course, the problem is our politicians, as shown by COVID, they take their guidance from these people. And that's you know, scientism. That, that, that the, yeah. These instrumentalist scientists control the politicians now. That's what we see from COVID. You know, so, so they, they're getting in there, but, but not the real scientists, because a real scientist is searching for the truth. I mean, I want to bring this back to, what you, to your, your statement uh, of this pointing heavy side cat solution, which involves electromagnetic fields, and in particular, the power flow of an electromagnetic field. And this is actually the cutting edge discussion, as far as we can tell at the moment. It seems like this solution has come back around. 
At least in pop science. I have and, yet to hear anyone inside of an academic position who is talking about it. Right. So this was actually very interesting. In the Veritasium video, he interviews a professor to talk about in this. The what video? The what video? Well, so there was a Veritasium. There's a channel on YouTube. It's called Veritasium, and he puts out science videos. He's very popular, and he just put out a video about uh, heavy side and the pointing vector as the un as an improved understanding of what is electric force. Let's say. Um, and he interviews an expert as part of this video. However, the expert is a historian of science. He is not a professor of electrical engineering. He is not a professor of, of physics. He is a historian. And this is exactly what you're saying. And they the come up with the same solution that you're proposing, essentially. That there is no... Uh, that what's happening inside of the wires is not central, that the energy is being transmitted outside of the wires to the load. And now, now that was heavy side. Right. Yes. But Kat, Kat is saying not what's happening in the, in the wires is not central. Uh, You're saying that there's nothing happening in the wire. There's nothing. There's nothing traveling along in the wire. Now, heavy side missed it, missed the point. And we lost another, what, 70 years before Kat stumbled on it because he was presented by a situation similar to Heaviside's problem of sending more signals from Newcastle to Denmark. If you scale it down in size, you get the computer. Got it. Oh, sorry. I just want to say, okay, so what is happening? Oh, see, if it's not inside of the conductor itself, what is this that is flowing? What do you say? Energy. What is now, what now, is this? Now, 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 energy. And for some reason, I miss this for 50 years. Energy abhors a change of medium. But what is energy? Energy. Ah, I'm not going to answer that. What is energy? But that's the centerpiece of your theory. No, not what is energy. But you have. What do you mean? How can energy be the the central actor in your theory if you if you won't tell us what it is? It comes to us from the sun. But what is it? It's energy. What do you, What do you mean? Like is it is it an is it a is it magical? Something comes to you from the sun. Is it a, is it another magical fluid? Pardon? Is it another magical fluid? No. Do you when you stand outside? Do you get warm? Yeah, the, the, the fact that something is coming from the sun and we call it energy is, again, not up for debate. The question is, okay, how okay. do you define so, energy? So, so right? no. in all that I, I write and everything I say, when I say energy, you say you replace that by something co which comes from the sun. And that, that's dealt with that. I don't, I don't, I don't, under, I don't follow you. I mean, I, I think that this is one of the hardest things in science to define. Energy is a very... It, it, well, light is coming from the sun. Light is coming from the sun, but there's also some kind of electromagnetic radiation that heats you. Well, the and light, the, the light is energi no, no, energetic, no, no, no. for sure. No, light, light is a form of what comes to you from the sun. What comes to you from the sun, let's say it's of different frequencies, and what comes... What, you, the light you see is a certain frequency range and so on. But the point I'm making is something comes from, to you from the sun. Now, you uh, were asking me to define what that is. And I said, no, it's what it is. That's deeply, it, it, that's deeply unsatisfying, Ivor. Yeah. So you so. have to decide whether in science you start with axioms or you don't no, i think that we have to start with peace we have to start with actors in science an, an axiom that i have is that energy exists and but you never ask the question of what is energy i agree that energy occurs i can, I can then proceed to say all energy okay okay now another axiom is there's no instantaneous action that, there is no instantaneous action at a distance, all right? Now, I cover that by saying if something at A inst instantaneously uh, has an effect at B, there is no distance between A and B. 
distance or space is is the ability to accommodate energy right now all well, we don't really know what energy is it's a very it's very difficult to talk about energy if we don't have a definition for it i suggest that energy is no, just i, said, I, su- I said, yeah i said I, I guess it's very important that that energy be defined and i think the only way we can define it is material no, is material that's in motion I, I was proceeding to say um we have in a universe where, where there's no instantaneous action of distance that is that is um this business they come up with is is nonsense it's called entanglement entanglement you, you know in order to proceed in the in the universe i live in you have to have no instantaneous action of the distance well one side of this pencil can move the other side instantaneously no no that's a good example because i worked on line printers and um so there was a hammer there was a hammer which was projected at the drum etched with all the characters and you had to fire the hammer at the right time <laughs> right but the trouble is the drum was rotating so it had to bounce off fast or it would smear the camera uh, smear the character that was printed and and what happened was you made the hammer shorter and shorter because for this hammer we projected it i'll talk about that later um you project it you see and and then when the front end hits it's the drum the rest of the hammer doesn't know you see so a message goes back at the speed of sound to say to the back end you better start moving you see so the back end starts moving you see and then it goes to the front end and said we're all right so the time delay for sound down the hammer and back is how long the hammer stays fixed to the drum sure but as soon as the back end of the hammer begins to move you see what you're talking about is signal transduction through a material which is different than the actual movement of the material where i would believe that you would not say that the back half of the hammer starts to move while the front end of the hammer is still in the same position like the front of this pencil is moving as the back of the pencil is moving and the signal transduction is separate because michael michael raised this as an example of instantaneous action but but when that ham that thing is moving and i said that gives me the opportunity to talk about a subject which is not electromagnetic theory and, and that's covered perfectly well but you see you you made the mistake of saying that that the effect is instantaneous. Well, no, the, no, no, the, I'm no, saying the, that the effect of the movement. Yes, I'm just saying this atom here is moving at the same time as this one. When the atoms are bound in a lattice, then the body moves as a composite. I'm that's sh- not that. That's not my universe. Well, so so, but hold on, hold on, hold on. I I, I don't think that we are. So let's not say um, a pencil. Let's use my hand. If I move my hand forward or backward, uh, my entire hand moves at the exact uh, instantaneously. The atoms on this plane of the hand and on this plane of the hand move at the same time right yeah but when your hand hits hits the surface yeah the the front part of your hand stops and the back part doesn't stop well, and that that's, has that's to do deformation mechanics that that's an that's an elastic it process it, it does not know that the front end of your hammers hand has hit the surface depending on how stiff it is it does right because stiffness st- stiffness changes speed of propagation there's nothing resisting the motion of the tip of this pencil but anyways my question is like this word energy can only be rationalized in terms of a material in motion e equals mc square energy has to mean something moving or it could be potential it has the potential to be moving but it always involves motion and this is what was rationalized to us when jewel looked at lavoisier's theory and was like hey I don't think there's a little fluid flying around. I think that these molecules are jittering about and that's how we get heat. And so energy has to be considered in terms of material in motion. My question is, what is that material that's in motion outside of the actual conductor itself? 
what is the material in motion halfway between the sun and the earth? Exactly. Get to work, kids. <laughs> it's energy. Energy is the material in motion. Now, now, when you get to energy, energy exists in a universe where, in Kat's universe, there's no instantaneous action at a distance. So what you have is you have energy arriving at one point, right? Or energy present at that one. But energy is material in motion. How can, you, how can a, a, material in motion arrive? What does that mean? For material in motion to arrive, it's already in motion. It's already arriving. You see what I'm saying? When you're, when you're, bu when you're building a theory or building theories about the universe, where do you start? You start because at one point, at that instant in time, there's no knowledge about the rest of the universe. All right? The only thing that's known is what's at that point, which is a point of zero dimension, and what's arriving at that point, at that instant in time. Something. Better be a material actor if we're talking about physics. Now, now because that's too difficult to think about, Cat comes up with um, a surface, a surface of, let's call it energy, um, like a piece of paper, moving forward like that so there's some kind of front that moves there's a front because, because so if, if we exactly. say that energy is material in motion you're saying that there is a front of material in motion that is moving along you, you see a surface all right. is composed of points right well it better be com comprised of atoms if we're talking about physics no i don't have atoms i i i was i was researching high-speed computers there were no atoms in the computer. That's because that's because you're an engineer. This goes back to the the big problem here. No, in my career, um, in Ferranti, and in um, uh, Los Angeles, and in in, um, in in Phoenix, the atom was never mentioned. That makes perfect sense because engineers aren't concerned with science; they're concerned with making things work. Yeah. So I had to make this signal going all that distance to not upset another signal. So I said, what is that signal? That signal, I trust you're willing to accept that that signal either contained energy or was energy. Which one do you want? Let's say contained uh, I think energy. was. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that. Look, contain, container is a physical idea, right? Materials can contain other materials. The idea that, that an idea like energy, it's not a material, it's an idea, energy. It's matter in motion, a material in motion. That's going to have to be happening. It <laughs> occurs. It can, it can do all of these things. It, it is an idea, though. And, and the fact that this idea, this dynamic front, is moving along is already a stretch of the imagination. But we can sort of see it happening, I think. Now, now what happened uh, was I, there's good reason why I came up with that wafer of, of energy. Cross-section. Is, is miscalled energy because it's energy density all right it's energy density right because you cannot have energy at the point because it has to be moving right no 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 if you had energy at a point it would be infinite energy no, i don't you don't have that at a point i mean we're talking about electric how, flux how did, right how did you make a point with infinite energy you had half infinite energy and you brought up another half of infinite energy and to the final step it took infinite work you cannot have energy at a point you can have energy density so this wafer has energy density not energy now uh, when i sent the logic signal from here to here what i sent was one of those followed by another one followed by another one, followed by another one. They did not know of each other's existence. When you, when you stand in the old days of Concord, um, when you stood there and the Concord hit you, the first 
sign that the Concorde was going to hit you was when it hit you, because the sound of the Concorde was slower than the Concorde aircraft. Now, the same way, the, the, these things that are moving along at the speed of light, they don't know whether they're the first one or whether they're one of many. There's no communication. And this is the Minkowski plot. Um, you know, if you do Minkowski, look up. It's the pointing vectors with Minkowski. No, 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 nothing to do with pointing vectors. I, don't, I think Minkowski so. Minkowski plus um, Minkowski plus elsewhere. And he has a cone like that. And everything at that point, think of an ice cream cone and another, another one upside down. Yeah. At that point, the only things that happen at that point, at that instant, are what is there at that point or what's arriving. The same with this. Now, what, what you do in the real world, we happen to, to make something which was a very convenient introduction to the nature of physical reality. And that was the high-speed digital computer, you see, because we were sending these signals at the speed of light. And I had to think about this. Now, all the academics and the Nobel Prize winner and the professors and the textbook writers don't actually have to think about it. But I had to come up with machines that worked. Right. So I had to think about it. I had to think seriously about it. My, my question is this. Um, when you say that there's the. Why are the wires necessary for this? If there's no current in the Why wire... Are the rails necessary to gu guide the train from London to Edinburgh? Why are they necessary? Well, because you have to have a physical connection between the two locations in order to put the... like The, the rails are absolutely mandatory for this. And something is... Yeah, I mean, if, the, if you have an electric tram, you can have uh, the wheels be electrified and the wheels turn from, from the electric... Right? Like, the electricity can come up from the rails. You have to have a track. You can well, have more, a monorail. Most, more simply, the wheels don't work without the track. Yeah, like you have to have something. Uh, I, qu I quote Heaviside, um, 1880. If there is an instrument in circuit at Edinburgh, it is worked by energy that has traveled wholly through the dielectric, then finding its way into the instrument. That is nothing of what caused the instrument to react in Edinburgh was caused by anything traveling in the wires. Now, unfortunately... So then why couldn't you have wires that are made out of non-conducting materials? It seems like the, the material... Yeah. If the wires weren't doing anything, you would expect that the material that the wires were made out of would be inconsequential, and the only thing that would matter would be the dielectric. Now, the, right? the, the, the essential point about the wires is that they're different material from the dielectric between the wires. And why didn't anybody think of fiber optics, you see, until I thought of it only six months ago? Now, in the case of fiber optics, there's a fiber, and the energy travels down the fiber, and it abhors getting out into a different medium, which is the air. So it stays in there, all right? So, so uh, yeah. And well, this is a little, that one's a little bit easier to rationalize because you're actually talking about the total internal reflection of light. And so, you know, this is maybe an easier thing for us to imagine in so much as we can rationalize light. But it still begs this question of what is this material that's in motion in between there? The solution of these fields being the operators is not an endpoint solution. It's not the end say because a field is just a measurement of some effect. And so we're talking about this very reproducible idea where we can see the signal, see, we can, we can measure, we can interrogate, we can mathematically reconstruct the signal travels in this fashion and it follows these field mathematics and it is a near instantaneous transmission but we still don't apprehend how this materially occurs, which is the job of science. Science needs to provide us with a mechanism for how this actually happens. The energy we call E cross H, 
All right. It's a, it's a, it's it. Which is the cross product of the magnetic and the electric field. Sorry. Which is the cross product of the electric and the magnetic field vectors. Yeah, but you see, a a, a, a sheet of paper is the cross product of the height and the width. Now, would you like to get that involved in people learning about what a piece of paper is? Well, it's the cross product of the height and the width. A piece of paper doesn't exist if it has no height. I don't think I ever learned about what a piece of paper is. I think I just saw it. Right? This is the weird thing about this is the fact that I can lift a piece of paper and I can I can interrogate it and I can look at it and I can understand it and it is something yeah, that is very present. But when I look at with electricity and magnetism, these are things that are very, very difficult for the average person to interrogate. And so you create these shortcuts for being able to kind of to, to grasp them and to put them into your brain. Now, hopefully, we're going to talk about the Wakefield experiment uh, another day. But in the case of Wakefield, uh, it proves that a charged capacitor does not have a stationary electric field. A stationary electric field is an illusion. An electric field is an, an illusion. It's the coincidence of two E cross H electromagnetic fields. Now, Heaviside said we should not have started with electrical theory, with stationary fields. We should have started with mo moving fields. This is Heaviside, 1880, you know, a century and a half ago, totally ignored. Physical reality is not composed of things which are stationary. Now, you can get the illusion, like in a flywheel, that something's stationary when it isn't, all right? We, we live in a universe where there are a lot of illusions and definitely the, the and the 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 illusion of a magnetic field the illusion of an electric field now you can uh, give the illusion of a, a magnetic field with two e cross h what we call e cross h fields traveling through each other gives you the illusion of a magnetic field you can get the illusion of an electric field by two E cross H fields moving through each other. And it is the job of the scientists to take apart those illusions and to explain what the material actors are actually doing to accomplish those effects that we call fields. No, 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 no. What to deduce or get what causes it is completely separate from what it is. Now, what, what Kat did was he looked at a signal going along there and he didn't look at the cause and he didn't look at the effect. He said, I'm going to apply laws and stuff to the, what's passing by. And this was the big breakthrough of CAT. Nobody had ever done that. They say, what's the cause? What's the effect? That's all very well. But you see, you see, the universe is, is composed of things that are passing by not th things that are causing. Things that are causing things are caused by other things that are causing things. Well, by cause, we mean the mechanism. We mean that entire process from start to finish. The entire process of what causes it or the entire process of what's traveling by. Both, all of that, yeah, certainly. All of that no, should be involved. No, 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 all you know is what is passing by. You're not over there, you're here. You're looking at what's passing you by. So my, I, I, I think that this is not necessarily something we're going to be able to resolve right sorry, this moment. I pull, sorry, you'll have to repeat that. I, I'm saying that I'm not sure that we'll be able... This seems like uh, uh, a foundational distinction between worldviews here. My question is, did you solve this in the computer that you were building, and how did you solve it? So you identified that there was noise in these wires as they were transmitting over long distances. You realized that something was moving outside of the wires rather than inside of them. How did you solve this? How did you make the computer work once you realized it? I realized that something was outside of the wires no. 10, or, 10 or 20 years later. Mm. I, I will, At the I, time, did you manage to solve it? I sent a signal down a wire and it had an effect on another wire. And when the wires were far apart, the effect was very strange. And Ken Johnson, who should have been in Manchester,
for some reason, was walking down the corridor um, in Phoenix. You see, so I grabbed him and took him in my office. And I said, I don't, don't understand this. And he said, there are two modes. He said, when you, when you send a signal down one wire in the presence of another wire, that's illegal. The only thing that can go down two wires is um, common mode, the same signal, or what are they called? Or differential mode, opposite signals. You do all the maths and you show that those are the two legal signals that can go down. So what was I looking at? I was looking at, I wasn't looking at the, the, the big signal I thought I was sending down the wire and seeing a little effect on the other wire. I was seeing two big signals going down both wires, but in the second wire, one of them was negative and they were nearly equal. Okay. So then, of course, he'd given me the tip to look for the two modes. And I did all the mathematics and all that that proved that you couldn't send a signal down one wire and leave another wire unaffected. And that was published in the top journal, which it shouldn't have been, in 1967. And it's been ignored ever since. And, and no expert on doing computer programs for interference between wires knows anything about that article, my 1967 IEEE article, which obviously shouldn't have been published. But um, presumably the, um, the referees looked and they said, oh, it's Motorola. They're the leaders in integrated circuits. So obviously this would be all right. I, I don't have to read it. You see, so it slipped through. Now, um, the, the mathematics, because I was already hostile to mathematics, um, because of my mother's experience, who was a leading mathematician, um, I, I had algebra, you know, which is very simple. But the boss of R&D said, uh, what you're saying is nonsense. You'll carry the can. But he also said, um, <coughs> you've got to have more complicated mathematics. And I refused to have it. Uh, differential equations, you see. So uh, he sent... Uh, Wally Raisin into my home and said, if you don't add the, the fancy math to your article, you lose your job, you see. So I said, uh, look, can they publish it with my name on it, not on it? No, you can't, you see. You can't publish all this fancy math with my name not, not involved in it, you see. So I, I went to the head of the Institution of Electrical uh, Institute of Electrical and Elect Institute I Triple E to the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and I said, "A fellow of your college is saying I'm going to be fired if I don't publish something in the I Triple E that I disapprove of. Please do something." And and I got a phone call um, in the last two hours before Christmas from the top man in in. Um, in the IEEE, uh, uh, and unfortunately for him, I was, I was there, although you're supposed to run away a few hours before Christmas. And um, anyway, the, the conclusion was this was a matter for my company, not for the institution, that somebody was being threatened with firing if he didn't publish on his name something that he did prove it. Now, the proof is there because I left. Uh, the company for other reasons, but I did publish three years later. But the head of R and D, because I refused to do the differential equations, he got Paul Nygaard to do the differential equations. You see, so we had my paper with my algebra, which is simple, and with Paul Nygaard's differential equations, and they're both there. You can check it. You can go on my my paper and say, well, what, why are there two lots of mathematics? Well, because because Cat was going to be fired if he let this in. But in my article, I, it's written by either Cat, but I said, I thank Paul Nygaard for adding the differential equation. So the record is there that, that you're not allowed to publish things which don't have 
more fancy man. It reminds you a lot of the introduction of or uh, the insistence on Latin in the early church services, right? And the idea that eventually people got sick of that. Obviously, we had the Gutenberg Press and the biblical literature was starting to be published in people's vernacular language. But there was a great many centuries before that became so. And it really smells a lot like the same situation where you want to keep like the why did the priests do that? Why did they insist on Latin being read at the masses? It sounds to me like they wanted to justify they wanted some job security. They wanted to put themselves between the audience and you know, the deity. And in this case, it seems like there's a lot of places where complex mathematics are being inserted for the sole purpose of justifying the the mathematician's role in the explanation, which might be you know, better without that complex mathematics. And we see this... If you, if, if you uh, think of science and religion, modern physics is not in the category science. Modern physics is, re is, re is religion. It's hard to argue with. Pardon? I said that's hard to argue with. That is hard to argue with. Uh, and yeah, it bit. seems like it will remain squarely in the position of religion until it provides uh, material actors for phenomena. <laughs> uh, and, and what you've got, what you have is cat. Imagine cat in the cathedral down the road in the arguing about theological issues in the, in the cathedral. You know, the whole thing's a nonsense. You're, the whole idea you're lucky they don't cut your head off. You see, the problem was cat, cat get caught, get caught in a major technological advance, which was a change from uh, radar, wireless TV, and so on to digital. You see, and and the system could not cope with that, so the system blocked digital, and and it calls it now calls computer science digital, but computer science degree has no science in it. It's programming. Mm -hmm. You see, nobody is taught digital electronics. They're still taught the fancy maths. And, of course, they're frightened of it. And let, or if they stay, they think it's all very clever, which it isn't. It isn't. It's very, very simple, you see. Now, what, once, you get, once you get to the truth, the nearer you get to the truth, the simpler it becomes. Yeah. Y you know, and now these guys... They're called DJHPP, um, are blocking a massive simplification of electromagnetic theory. Now, this is this this is this is very very serious. Oh, by the way, DJHPP, uh, Tony Davis, um, Josephson, the Nobel Prize winner, Howie, head of the Cavendish, um, P. Palmer. Uh, and United for Services to Physics, Pepper, they are blocking a massive simplification of electromagnetic theory. Now they're buried in this weird mathematics, you know. You know, and if you read a book on, on now, you, when you came to me about advances in uh, in uh, whatever, you quoted all these people I've never heard of. You see, all I did was research high-speed digital electronics, you see. I, di I didn't go off to say, what, it, what did people say in, uh, in electromagnetic theory 200 years ago? You know, Maxwell's equations, uh, uh, nobody reads Maxwell's equations, you see. Maxwell's equations are, are a shambles. <laughs> you know, it is a part. very beautiful four-part essay, though. If anybody has a chance, I highly recommend it, especially the non-mathematical portions. Maxwell has a very eloquent description of what he thinks is happening, which I think is is highly relevant still. I, I highly recommend it. What, you, you recommend Maxwell's two volumes, Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism? Uh, I'm thinking of the four original essays that he published in, a, in some sort of... I'd have to look it up for you. Um, I'll put it in the description for folks later. But I think that this, this might be a good place to, to sort of to wrap the discussion that we've had, which has basically come down to the fact that Ivor Cat 
over the course of his career, was confronted by the strange behavior of electronics. Two signals traveling along parallel, or a signal traveling along a wire, affects a wire that is running parallel to it, despite the fact that there has no been there has been no signal placed into it, and that has set you down on the road of questioning what is electric current, where is this force moving, and you have arrived at the same conclusion that Heaviside arrived at, which is that what is being transmitted is being transmitted outside of the wires, and you go one step further to say that there is nothing happening in the wires. Period. I really have to get in with something. Um, the point was, through all the mathematics, I proved that only two signals could travel down two wires. One was equal and opposite, and the other was equal. They called them, I wish I could remember. Anyway, so I have the photographs in my 1967 article, but they travel at different velocities. Right. Hmm. So, so you can see in the picture published in 1967 on my website, you can see two signals that because they travel at different velocities, they separate out. Right. Now, this signal obeys all the algebra. This signal obeys all the algebra. But before they separated out, one signal had electric current coming this way down a wire, and the other signal had electric current down, going the opposite way down the wire. And Cat didn't know, did not notice that for 48, 45 years, because Cat was a badly trained parrot, but he was a parrot. He was a parrot. You see, he was trained enough to not see that in his published article, he had a picture of two electric currents traveling in opposite directions down one wire, right? Now, nobody, of course, nobody comments on the whole article, the 20-page article, and certainly don't comment there. But the point is, all of this is published. It's there it's to find it. Electric current traveling in opposite directions down one wire. And it was published 50 years ago in, in, in a peer-reviewed journal. Go and check it out, folks. Go see for yourselves. We'll put, it, we'll put the links in the description so that people can follow up on this themselves if well, they're interested. I think, I think it's figure 37. You get That's a long paper. Two, you get two currents flowing in opposite directions down one wire. I mean, that's what happens if you hang on to the idea of electric current, you, you see. Now, within that idea... Does it contain electric current going in opposite directions down one wire, you see? Those electrons, they, 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 they wave to each other as they pass, <laughs> you see? I mean, I mean, I mean the, 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 <laughs> the thing is, this nonsense survives because you're taught it. When you're five, you probably connect a battery to a lamp, don't you? Or when you're seven. Some years children old, do. School. Some children do, yes. Uh, and then when you the other ones just stick their fingers in the socket <laughs> and they figure it out that way. Uh, that was me. When you're ten, now, now, then, then the lower echelons get this parrot training for eight years, don't they? And the higher echelons have to be better trained parrots, so they get another five years. You you're trained in this for twenty years. And that makes it very, very difficult to go back and to reimagine. And that's kind of something that we've covered in the conversation, which is that science as a discipline of explaining is not a productive discipline. It is a discipline that needs to be separated out from engineering and technology as much as possible because it's not necessarily useful for those things. It is separate, but, distinct. And if it proves useful, it's down the line. Yes, but the software... For, for predicting crosstalk interference between one and another does not include my 1967 paper. They don't know about my 1967 paper, you see. Now, that software to help people, practical people, which we're implying or we're thinking about, to put together working computers contains error, falsity in it, you see. So, so it doesn't predict properly. 
Mm. And, and if that's what you do, if you say I'm a good practical engineer, I'm not, I'm not concerned with, with facts, you end up with the third, third world war, you know, which was the glitch. Of course, that's all right, because the probability that we'll have a third world war is only one in a million. So d don't worry about it, you see. There's 70 billion people or 7 billion people. 70 billion, my goodness. And, and, and things like something will only happen, the chance is only one in a million. We don't worry about, well, where does the good practical man come in that, you see? Well, that's the problem. So it's not that science doesn't affect engineering. It's just that you can get by for a long time without actually knowing what's going on. And it may have off-target effects down the road. We may develop a product, particularly you see this in the biomedical industry with pharmaceutical development, where you develop a product, seems fine, but if you ignore the science too long, then eventually you're going to find out that there was off-target effects because you didn't understand how some process worked, which is what science does, is it explains to us what the actual cells are doing, what how the DNA is doing, what the objects are doing. And because you didn't understand that, you end up actually having faults that if you ignore them too long, you kill people. And it probably just happens a lot less in signal engineering that people get killed from these problems, and therefore they're not addressed. And that's the problem with science and engineering being very separate, but importantly related disciplines. But you see, DJ HPP are using instrumentalism, which is Popper 1935, to block um advances which are needed in, in the digital computer you know they say well why do we need a new theory because no one's gonna die right like no one's gonna die from some cross reaction with medicines here like there's no real incentive no one's gonna get sued out of existence there's not huge uh you know, subtle, there's not huge court cases that are going to result in this being changed, whereas it would happen that way in the medical industry. And that's to some extent protects that science a little bit more. Now, DHJPP, um, DHJPP, will they block um, scientific advance? In so much as it's useful for, for them, of course. Like if that's their, if they're incentivized to do, s of course, why not? In some way, and there has to be there has to be a, t a large enough turnover where it becomes part of the extra scientific understanding of the world that current works differently than is taught in the academy, and then the academy will have to turn over. This is one of those cases where the shift must come from the people that are outside of that world in order for it to make its way into that world. And it may be that there is a fracture here. There is a schism. You know, we talk about this being a version of a religious teaching. Religions have schisms all the time. And there may be a schism in science where there is institutional science, academic science, and there is the extra academic science. And we have to live with the, with, with the idea that Perhaps the the DHJPPs of the world will never change their way of thinking. It is not the institutions that have to be turned over. It is the cultural understanding of these ideas that must be turned over. And there are plenty of people outside the halls of that world that are interested in understanding. And that's what we do. That's what demystifying science is about. It's for those people. It is not to convert the institution. I am not, I am not a crusader that is out to change the institution, my interest is to give space for ideas that cannot be centered at the institutions. We will create our own world. Now, um, uh, Popper, in 1935, said the, betray the betrayal of science by instrumentalism. But if you come forward to today, 80 years later, um, those people, who, who came along with me um, in advancing science, my closest supporters, virtually all of them have walked away. It takes a toll. It's very difficult. It's a difficult place to make a career. And it was a difficult place to make a career prior to the internet, prior to alternative sources of press. Being labeled as a crackpot, being labeled as a heretic, these are similar things. And now, Malcolm, sorry. 
Oh, go ahead. Malcolm Davidson, I tried to say it last time. Uh, they're all scared. They don't understand. They don't care. Now, what we've got to understand why uh, Kat's closest associates, um, like Malcolm Davidson said, he got tired of banging his head against a brick wall. So he went away for 10 years, but he came back. Sure. But virtually everybody else has walked away. It's hard, to, it's hard to spend a lifetime working on a project if you feel like it will not succeed. You, you have to give people the idea, you have to give people the hope that there will be some change in their lifetime. Otherwise, how can you expect them to continue to give their lives to it? They want to have children, they want to have houses, they want to have cars, yachts, travels, caviar. There are things that people want that the life of a scientist that is sitting in his room and is writing out why things don't make sense cannot offer them, and it is impossible to blame them for that. The calling of a scientist is separate from the calling of the rest of the world. Mike Gibson was thrown out of college because he was spending too much time reading Everside. And <laughs> so I said, come and stay with me. So he came to stay with me, um, let's say 40, 60 years ago, and spend a month here. Now, he is the top expert on Heaviside's five volumes, or he was. He's walked away. He's, he's not functioning. He will, he will write to me about Trump <laughs> about, about, <laughs> at great length, but he will not communicate on electromagnetic theory. That sounds like that, a broken that, heart, Ivor, more than anything else. That is what we have to understand, because I, I mentioned the name, but I can come up with many, many names. And, and one idea is, of course, oh, I was so obnoxious that um, he, he's ruining the whole thing. <laughs> but, but the problem is, if I was so obnoxious, why will they not combine with each other, bypassing me? That's a good question. See? Now, the people who understand, because they cannot believe that science is in transition, you know, because they don't have the historical sense of, oh, uh, uh, and they have not read uh, philosophy of science, history of science, sociology of science. And, and the problems in science are not scientific. They're historical, uh, sociological, political. What was the other one? Um, uh, and these people. Philosophi financial. Philosophical? <laughs> philosophical. I think philosophical or financial, I guess. No, no. Sociology of science, history of science. Philosophy of science. Philosophy of science. Yeah. Now, now, the problem is, you see, I thought that it was all right to give people degrees in things like engineering or science when they knew and continue to know no history of science, no philosophy of science, no sociology of science. I did research that a few decades ago. How many uh, degree courses in science mentioned Kuhn? the structure of scientific revolution. There was only one university in, in, in England that, that mentioned Kuhn, the structure of scientific revolutions. You see, they don't know. They don't know there are revolutions in science. Most Could people that suggest? practice science do, though. Could, I've, never, I've never encountered someone who practices science at the institutional level that is not well aware of paradigm shifts. Again, I think this falls into the category of white lies that we tell to children. They do get paved over, right? They do. You do see that things just appear to have been always this way. Yeah. In a sense, there's, there's a little remark made that, oh, once there was these primitive people who had this idea about phlogiston or something, but... We just brush over them, right? It's, uh, it's both mentioned and silenced at the same time. John Dory, fellow of the Electrical Institute of Electric Engineers, recently said to me that he did not care whether he was on the side of um, um, Galileo or Newton. You see? Uh, that seems okay. I said that seems. Oh, you mean oh, you're not deciding between Galileo and do you mean Galileo and Newton? He didn't care about it. He hasn't read about it. Uh, 
the earth moves. And that's hard to... That's and that's an engineering perspective, right? Yeah, it works or it, it works. doesn't, you know? I know a lot of engineers what that are like, who... What, what, what works? I know a the, lot of engineers... Go ahead. The, the, the wire, the, cur the current, the circuit that you're trying to debug, whatever it is, it's like, does it work? I don't care how it works if I know that it does no, work. No, no, no. I thought we changed over to saying how much history of science, sociology of science, philosophy of science, does your highly qualified scientist or engineer know? Oh, so and the answer is the answer is virtually nothing, and it's proven by COVID. Because I'm so old, <laughs> I'm I'm watching COVID all day. I watch YouTube for fifteen minutes, one expert in COVID, and then I watch another expert in COVID for fifteen minutes, and I think they don't know each other. I was getting radicalized. They don't know each other's specialism because COVID involves about six specialities, doesn't it? Yeah. At least. You know, and, and, and each man within one uh, island. Don't forget the economists. It's called a knowledge island in my book, Computer Worship. Hmm. A man within a knowledge island doesn't have any idea of the other knowledge islands. Now, now, now COVID, 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 COVID it's sick. These people don't know. They don't. They don't know, and and they're advising the politicians. And they they just. I mean, I mean, I never dreamt that, or everybody could be as ignorant as COVID has proven to me. Because COVID, well, the trouble is, it wasn't a new subject to me because I was sucked in through AIDS and climate change. You know, so I I, I did do my homework, but but um, so I'm not the man in the street but um the, the whole idea that that in the middle of covid you got you got loads and loads of apprentices and no sorcerer you know these people they, they don't know anything they, they they know a particular speciality there's a there's a man who i would say they don't know everything and that is and that's and that's the problem, right? No one person can know everything, and so greater crosstalk between disciplines is necessary. But greater I communication skills between scientists, greater communication infrastructure, greater ability to work towards solving a problem as opposed to working towards solving your problem, which is probably that you need a new pool in the backyard, right? People are not actually concerned together with the mission of science, which is explaining nature. And that is, and that's been a long problem, and that's something that we come back over to over and over again. But Ivor, we've we've been we've been at this for almost two hours, so I think I think we should I think we should wrap for today. It's been a fascinating conversation. I think we've we've gotten a lot out of it. Something else talking to you, it really is quite extraordinary, quite extraordinary, and to you as well. Yeah. Yeah very impressive i'm really impressed by by what you're doing but um and, and the way you let let me interrupt with other other items you, you know you you open it up um is uh, um, i mean i mean you, you do control it um sort of but but i think the way you do the balance of should i interrupt or should i not interrupt is remarkable. It's tightly and, controlled and I, chaos. And I, w I was at a total loss over what would happen uh, uh, today. You know, I, I couldn't imagine what would happen. And then I got this book and I realized it's all in, in this um, Death of Electric Current 1980. You know, you'll put that on. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd, I'd like to congratulate you for your performance today. <laughs> um, and the, the way you interact as well is... <coughs> <laughs> it's very impressive yeah thank you well oh, yeah. we'll we'll put that we'll definitely add those uh we'll add those references in so folks can find them they'll be available right there in the youtube video so will you leave my praise for you in it <laughs> uh well depend it depends how self-congratulatory we feel when we go to edit this <laughs> but uh maybe maybe not we'll see but we but, but, but. <laughs> well, well, uh, <laughs> if you wish i was at a, I was at a loss to think, God, I told you I was terrified of this second interview. You know, I was a loss because I thought uh, you're opening up what I call a can of worms. You know, it's 
It's an important can of worms, though. That's, that's what's wonderful about having this discussion. That's why I, I'm glad that you did it, because this is an important problem that everyone is, is dealing with. It's, I don't think you understand how important it became when Derek released that video the other day. This is literally at the top of popular science right now on the internet. Not like magazine, like, you know, popular science, but like internet popular science just started to care about this a lot just like two days ago. I don't know when he released this video. Two days ago. Two days I'll, ago. I'll send you the video. This so is an extremely important discussion that we're having. We talked about all of the relevant points. No, no. Is it your David or did you stumble on it? Um, so this is a channel that uh, is very, very popular. And I'll, I'll watch his videos as he releases. He doesn't make them as often as he used to, but he's literally the biggest distributor of science, pop, of popular science in the world David right now. What? David what? The channel is called Veritasium. It's run by a man named Derek Mueller. Yeah. You see, that illustrates the point. I've been at this, essentially this subject, for, for 60 years, 40 years, and I've never heard of him. And, and we, we have no organization. Uh, we have no... And the people who should be in the organization, walk away, Yeah, you see. Well, I'll send you, I'll send you a link to it. I have it open already. It's serious, already. because the final, the final death throw, the final coup de grace was COVID, you know, which, which is extremely dangerous. I mean, it, it, time, time will tell if it ends up being a real coup de grace because it's, it doesn't seem like it's, it's going away. I, I don't know. The, the world is really very, very insane right now. And I don't understand why things are working out the way that they are working out. But I, I think you, 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 you can appreciate my view that um, COVID has illustrated for me a lot of the problem in electromagnetic theory. I mean, I, I, that's, it's, hard, it's hard to argue with the fact that the experts that are creating the advice and putting it out into the world are not as smart or as functionally aware as they should be. And that's, that's a big problem, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of why we've started this channel is because we want to bring people together that, that are actually scientists. And scientists are almost always laboring on the edges of society because you cannot make money with science. Science is not a moneyed discipline. If you happen to be rich, great. If you're not, you're screwed. Unless you want to build stuff and become an engineer, yeah. right? Unless you want to stop caring about science and concern yourself with engineering. By the way, in that, in that case, in that, that scenario, cat is an aberration. Because Cat made big money you in engineering and big reputation, and he then disappeared. And the minute you started asking scientific questions, people were like, "Uh, uh, uh." Yeah, you made money in engineering. You didn't make money in science. Nobody makes money in science except for pe pop scientists who are just encrusting and calcifying the old dogma, which is anti-scientific, right? That's the only way to make science is by working against science. Nobody makes money off of science who, who's doing actual science. It, I, I would go so far as to say that science, doing actual science in an atmosphere where science is a political tool is nearly impossible because there are huge interests that want to preserve science the way that it was a generation ago or two generations ago when they came up because they haven't spent a lot of time breaking it. You know, we spend a lot of time looking for people to interview who have theories. We need people with theories. It's not interesting to talk to somebody who's just presenting the same sort of ideas that they, you know, you don't want to parrot. we learned in high school or college. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to parrot on the show. You want someone who who has come up with something interesting and novel. And those people are very, 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 very hard to find. None of them are at top universities. And almost none of them are in the physics, biology, or chemistry departments. Because those people are generally parrots. Or they've I, been no sopped up it. by engineering. Yeah, or they're engineering. And they're just not asking these questions. And they have them in their minds because they're like, ah, you know, it's kind of weird, but... That's not, that's not what I get paid for. It's not my day job. Um, now, I thought that I was fortunate 
to go to the most wealthy college in Oxbridge, Trinity College, Cambridge, Newton's College. I thought that was the centre of, of academia, you see. Mm. Trinity College, Cambridge has half as many Nobel Prize winners as France. <laughs> and <laughs> and only, only in the last few days I realised that all the chances all the uh, careerists make a beeline for Trinity. Yeah. Trinity, that's, that's the low point in science yeah. because of its reputation. It's the wealthiest college in Oxbridge. You know, well, where, if you were after career, reputation, Nobel Prize and all these things, where would you target? Trinity College, Cambridge. So I'm sitting at high table with all these Nobel Prize winners. Oh, yeah. Have you heard the idea of the Nobel Prize being the club? I've come across that uh, a few times. You, mm. know, the club. You, you join the club, you become a... <laughs> it's a but it takes so long. To, it t- took me so long to see this. You know, you know when, when, when the government wanted to put money into me, um, so I'd go around and go to universities and say, I'm bringing this government money to, to do cat spiral, you see. And I went to Grimsdale in Sussex University and I went to Lee in, in um, Brunel University and I assumed they were interested in the idea and advancing computers. I didn't realise they were interested because I was bringing government money. Mm. I only realised that in the last month or two. I thought these professors were interested in science. Almost none, yeah. And, and, I, and I got that wrong for... 30, 40 years, you see, because I, I think uh, improving computers and, uh, and scientific advance and computer advance is very, very interesting compared with, um, you know, getting a bit of money from the government. Yeah. And I think that is the heartbreak that hits most graduate students during the first year of graduate school. And that's why there's a pretty high attrition rate for the first year of grad school, too, because it's the first time you realize that, oh, no, this is... Not necessarily about me figuring out something that I think is really interesting. It's about me securing a place in this machine. You write your first grant. You yeah. you start to really. I mean, that's like, your main project, right? Like. Our first year was writing a grant. I mean, yeah, yeah. that's I it. Mean, that's what we did. That was the big project yeah, for the was. master's degree. It was, yeah. wasn't it? It was the NSF grant. Right. So, listen, Ivor, I think we have to let you go for today. Uh, we can brainstorm another discussion down the road, but. Uh, it we've been sit- we've been stuck in. Was- well, I've been sitting in this chair for two and a half hours right now, so I need to do a little stretch. <laughs> but uh, hey, man, it's been really wonderful to talk to you today. And uh, yeah, let's- it's such a relief because I-, I was really frightened of this interview. I'm I'm glad it wasn't as terrifying as yeah. you had imagined. Uh, we have nothing but love and respect for you, so don't worry. We will uh, we'll be in touch as as we get it edited down, and and we'll figure out where to go from here. All right, Ivor. Have, have a great day, sir. Bye-bye, then. Yeah. Bye.